Coming to you from the Sheldon Concert Hall in St. Louis, Missouri. St. <laughs> St. Louis, as everybody knows, is located uh, right in the Midwest, nearly in the center of the country, but things could have been different. There's an ancient fault line that could have split the continent. It could have created an ocean along your northern neighbors around present-day Minnesota and Wisconsin. My next guest is trying to uncover signs of this fractured geological past. He's part of a team creating a sort of, sort of a telescope to peer underground with an interesting set of tools. He's using earthquakes and gravity. And we're going to test one of these out in a little bit. And if you want to participate in our little experiment right now, I take out your smartphones, you can download an app to your smartphone called iSeismometer. We have both iPhone and Android versions of this. We're going to do a little experiment with it later. So just to, let's, let's move along with that. Michael Weissession is a professor of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Washington University here in St. Louis. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Ira. It's a, it's a real honor to be on your show. <laughs> Tell us about this ancient fall line. Where, it, where is it? How do, we, how do we know it exists? Why are you interested in it? I'll, I'll pick any one of those questions. A absolutely. So, you know, geologically, people usually think that the action happens on the edges of the continents, right? If you want to find an earthquake in the United States, you go to San Francisco or Seattle or Alaska. Uh, but uh, 1.1 billion years ago, uh, this was the center of attention here, and there was a massive rift it actually extended from Oklahoma all the way up to Canada and back down again uh, through uh, Illinois and Indiana. And at this time, this was the African Rift Valley uh, of its age. Uh, the continent was splitting apart and the crust was thinning. And something unusual happened, though. There seemed to have been a hot spot in the region like what's causing all the volcanoes in Hawaii. It seems to be a rare combination of a rifting, a splitting apart of a continent with a hot spot and you released at this time two cubic million kilometers of lava. Wow. Uh, and this far dwarfs anything that we have seen in the last, uh, you know, tens of millions of years. As, as I mentioned before, you use uh, the earthquakes themselves and gravity to uh, map the fault lines. There's a gravity map of the U.S. right there on the screen behind us. What areas have different gravity measurements from one to the other? How do we interpret what we're seeing? So es map. essentially, usually, uh, in this map, places that are purple and the, the, uh, the line in the center of the image here, uh, that purple line represents a high gravity anomaly. That means, you know, you may not realize this, but the, the, uh, ex the pull of gravity actually varies slightly as you move about Earth's surface. It's a result in changes in density of the rock underneath you. Now, normally, when you cross a rift, like the African Rift Valley, your gravity is a little bit weaker because you've stretched and thinned the crust and you filled it in with sediments which are less dense. This scar is just the opposite. It's a gravity high. Gravity pulls you a little bit more and it's because there are 20 kilometers deep of basaltic lava that filled in this rift. In fact, instead of the crust being thin, the crust is actually 20 kilometers thicker than normal because of this massive amount of lava that filled it and, in. And the lava's got iron, rich in iron and things like that that affect the, the magnetic fields and gravity, and stuff like that. Yes, the, when you have lava and then you have hot fluids that flow through often for millions of years, you do some interesting things. This actually is important for the history of our country because uh, this is the largest reserves of pure copper anywhere in the world. That's why it's there. And it's these hot fluids flowing through the basaltic lava pulled out metals that don't like to fit in the crystal structure of rock very well. And this was, you know, the mines along here in Minnesota and Wisconsin really fed our industrial revolution, uh, you know, and the... It's like where you have the Iron Range in Minnesota, things that's like that's exactly where it comes, where, where all that stuff came from. So these gravity anomalies help to pinpoint what you're calling the, the mid-continental rift. I don't think we've ever heard it talked about that way. 
<laughs> yeah, so, so St. Louis, you know, we have a different idea of a rift here, right? Because we have the real... We're not thinking rift. political rift here. We're not, <laughs> right. okay. Yeah, it's not the Mason-Dixon line. It's the, it's the other direction. It's a north-south trending rift. And, and, you know, we have earthquakes around here. And that's a result of the fact that there was another rift here 750 million years ago, the real foot rift, where the crust was also thin. Only it's actually a zone of weakness in the crust. So as stresses occur, you get earthquakes along the, in places like New Madrid. This mid-continent rift is like a scar that's healed over with very thick scar tissue. It's actually stronger than the surrounding crust, so it has no earthquakes. We, we actually had the set of seismometers up here for two years. We recorded thousands and thousands of mine and quarry blasts. We recorded 12 earthquakes that were about a magnitude one in size, which is essentially nothing. So, so this, this region has no earthquakes because it's so healed over by the, uh, the, the thick lava that filled it in. Well, then now that you, you, you see the, the gravity part, how do you use the earthquakes? You mentioned that we've had earthquakes here. How do you use the earthquakes to fill in the rest of the picture? So actually, we use earthquakes from other parts of the world. And, and you mentioned the seismometer. You know, um, we can't see through rock, right? This is a problem that geologists have had for centuries, right? I can point a telescope in the sky. I, I can see galaxies billions of light years away. I can't tell you what's a, a, you know, a foot beneath the, uh, the ground. Um, but we can hear what's in the Earth. You know, my wife's a veterinarian. She uses a stethoscope to hear what's inside an animal. I have a seismometer that I can use to hear what's inside the planet and anything in the planet that makes noise, human generated or earth generated, makes a sound. And so we listen to the earthquakes arriving from around the world coming up underneath our network of seismometers and it allows us to make 3D images much like a sonogram does. And that's why I asked you to download the app I seismometer because we're going to do a little seismic experiment right now, aren't we? Tell yeah, us what we're going to do. Okay, so, um, so this is a typical seismogram. There's a, a lot going on here. First of all, there are three components because we live in a three-dimensional spatial universe. So there's up, down, left, right, and front and back. And if you look at the iSeismometer app, there are many good phone apps that, will, that have seismometers. I like this one in particular because it does give you all three components. And if you sort of shake it different directions, you can see different of wow. the three seismograms actually vibrate. And I have, uh, I have a demonstration here using a program called Quake Catcher Network. Um, which was designed to actually record people's laptops from around the world. Uh, there have been cases uh, this, uh, where uh, earthquake has been recorded by essentially, you know, a majority of Starbucks in the country. Uh, you, you can upload your, your signal from your laptop to this centralized location. But what I have here is actually a, an accelerometer, a type of seismometer, that is... Um, uh, that is plugged in through the USB port. And this is a great tool, by the way, for teachers. It's used in classrooms across the country. Um, you can demonstrate how an earthquake operates. Um, to give you a sense of the, the sensitivity, though, if I just stomp from here, um, Whoa. you can see I oh, yeah. totally swamp the signal there. I even um, got it on my, my app registry. Right. <laughs> and I want to do a little bit of a, an experiment here. I would like everyone on the left side to stomp their feet at the same time. One, two, three, stomp. Okay. Whoa. Wow, that was pretty Look at impressive. that. All right, let's wow. try the right side here. One, two, three, stomp. Uh, yeah, that's about the same size, maybe a little bigger. All right, now the central part. One, two, three, stomp. Wow, All right. that, that's big. That, now, I don't know scale, if huh? this is going to work, but I want everyone in the balcony. <laughs> All right, we'll see, because now the signal, the vibration is going to have to come down through the walls. I, I don't know that this is going to work, but we'll give it a shot. One, two, three. Whoa. There it is. You caused the whole building to shake, and we recorded it up, up here on the seismometer. Now, our, 
our, the seismometers we use for our research are so sensitive, we record small earthquakes in New Zealand or Japan or anywhere around the world. And so that gives us the ears to the ground that we use to, to make three-dimensional images of what the Earth is made of. And that tells us how plate tectonics works and how the Earth is, is moving. Um, did this group of sensors that you have around, uh, did they reveal a anything about the geology of the mid-continent rift? What we notice, uh, and in this diagram on the left hand, you see the location of the seismometers. Uh, our deployment of over 80 seismometers was timed with a project called Earthscope, which was a fabulous National Science Foundation project that involved moving an array of 400 seismometers, slowly ac sweeping across the country over 10 years. And actually now it's been moved off to Alaska. And so we had a large number of seismometers and, and uh, the images on the right show the depth to the what's called the MOHO, which is the, actually named after uh, the, uh, Andrea Mohorovicic. Uh, we can never pronounce his name, so we call it the, the MOHO. It's the boundary between the crust and the mantle. And this boundary is normally about 40 kilometers beneath continents, 40 to 45 kilometers. Beneath the mid-continent rift, we see that dropping down to more than 60 or 65 kilometers, more than 20 kilometers thicker than usual. And that's due to the, the unique history where as the crust rifted and thinned, lava began pouring in, which was heavy, and pushed, depressed it down, which left room for more lava to flow in. And by the time the process was entirely done, you have, as I said, more than 20 kilometers huh. worth of lava. I'm Ira Plato. This is Science Friday from PRI Public Radio International. Talking with uh, Michael Weissessen about uh, a clinic he's conducting in uh, earthquakes and seismology and how to detect them. We have a Someone in the audience here, yes. With fracking in Oklahoma, does it affect the crust that, built, that was built from the basalt lava? Um. So the, the fracking in Oklahoma, what relationship so, does it have to the earthquake? So yes, thank you for that question. The, um, it used to be that the earthquake capitals of the U.S. Were, San Francisco, were California and Alaska. That is no longer the case. The earthquake center of the U.S. is in fact Oklahoma. Um, it used to get one or two magnitude three earthquakes a year. It now gets over a thousand. Um, and this is entirely due to the pumping of fracking fluids back into the ground. Now, interestingly, it's not the fracking process itself that generates the earthquakes, but it's taking these fracking fluids, which are often toxic and cannot be left at the surface, and pumped down deep about five kilometers. And in the process, it actually lowers the pressure but across the fall. Hey, let me give you an example. Um, would you push your hands together lightly and now slide your right hand up? Okay, so just slide it up like this. Okay, that's an earthquake. And at the surface, it happens fairly easily. Now I want you to push as hard as you can across your two hands. Now try to slide your right hand up. Okay, you can't do it. That's deep in the ground. The pressure keeps the fault closed and prevents earthquakes from happening. Now pump some lubricant, sort of oily fluid in between your hands and that wow. earthquake will happen. Wow. So it, it only happens where you have pre-existing faults. And so these are old faults. Again, the continent is more than a billion years old there, but the faults will, are generally not active. However, when you pump the fracking fluid in and you happen to hit a fault, you will then generate yeah, sort of earthquakes. lubricating. Lubricating, that's fine. Yeah, that, exactly. Well, so when we had all these, the, the fault line there, why aren't we now not on beachfront property, you know, like that would be in California or whatever? Well, so that's a question that um, actually colleagues at Northwestern and University of Illinois have, have been working on. And it seems like right about this time, what is now the Amazon basin of South America, we called it at that point Amazonia, was sliding past the southern part of, of what is now the United States. And while it was sliding past, um, this is when the rifting across the Midcontinent Rift occurred. As soon as it broke away and the, uh, the ocean started opening there between you know, North America and Amazonia, that relieved the stress that was pulling our rift apart and our rifting stopped there. 
So oh. if it hadn't been for South America, we would now be in two pieces. So we owe, we owe Brazil a great debt. All right. Thank you. We'll all, we'll all keep that in mind. Thank you. Fascinating, Michael. Thank you very much for joining us. Michael White Session, Professor of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Washington University in St. Louis.